Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 20th Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Distinguished Lecture, sponsored by Roosevelt University's Center for New Deal Studies. My name is Margaret Brum, and I am the director of the Center for New Deal Studies and an associate professor of history here at Roosevelt. I'd like to start by briefly thanking those who have helped make this lecture happen. First, the Center has been extraordinarily pleased to have partnered with the Roosevelt Institute in New York to bring two of the Institute's fellows, Jeff, uh, sorry, Jeff Madrick last year and Dorian T. Warren this year, to Roosevelt for this lecture. The Institute, under the leadership of Felicia Wong, has become a magnet for public intellectuals like Dr. Warren, and we are grateful to the Institute's fellows for sharing their expertise with us. Second, I'd like to thank all the people here at Roosevelt who helped orchestrate this event. Aaron Ben Daniel Arba, my incredible graduate assistant, um, Lynette Davis and Julie Rowan in the Dean's office, Lauren Chill of Special Events, Tom Caro in Public Relations, and of course our AV technicians. A special thanks as well to Ann Roosevelt, our advisory board chair and university trustee, who could not be here today, but who has been tireless um, in her advocacy for the center and its work. And finally, I'd like to extend my gratitude to my colleagues and to Roosevelt students uh, for attending and supporting this lecture. In 1992, Roosevelt University held the first Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Distinguished Lecture with Koki Roberts as the speaker. And in 1995, when the center was founded, it took over the organization of this lecture. Since 1992, there have been 20 lectures, including today's, and all of them have dealt in some manner with the ideals, vision, and legacy of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Today's lecture, The Past, Present, and Future of the American Labor Movement, follows in that tradition. Indeed, few topics relate more directly to the Roosevelt's and the New Deal than that of labor and unions. In 1935, Roosevelt signed into law the National Labor Relations Act, which recognized the right of workers to organize and bargain collectively with their employers, and which continues to guide the legal framework of American labor relations. Driven forward by Senator Robert Wagner of New York, the law represented a sea change in the relationship between the federal government and American workers. While it may not have changed the basic structure of capitalism or disrupted the fundamental power relations between employers and employees, it inspired workers to imagine the federal government as a source of support rather than oppression, which had really been the case up until that point. Union membership, which in 1932 stood at 3.2 million, surged to 10.5 million in 1941 on the eve of World War II. Of course, the war then led to another burst of unionization in the country. Workers used the opportunity afforded them by the National Labor Relations Act and other measures to empower themselves vis-a-vis -vis their employers and the government. During the 1930s, they created a new Federation of Industrial Unions, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. They forged bonds with the Democratic Party, raised critical questions about the relationship of civil and economic rights, fought to promote, protect, and then enhance the welfare state, and rallied for government regulation of industry and the labor market. And an outpouring of art, literature, and music that probed working class struggles while celebrating workers <clears throat> stimulated a national conversation about class, citizenship, and American identity. In an era of mass unemployment, ordinary workers and their leaders exhibited substantial agency, pushing politicians employers and others to acknowledge and address class inequities that would have that in ways that would profoundly influence the future of the American work experience. So viewed from the perspective of previous decades, workers and their political allies forged a radically new deal for the American people. Of course the 1930s was not the birth of the labor movement, but it was a pivotal decade in the emergence of the modern labor movement and in the articulation and establishment of worker rights as civil rights. Today, unions face dwindling membership in a hostile political climate, but the reforms and lessons of the 1930s have not been lost. At the grassroots level, the country is seeing a tremendous resurgence of labor activism 
as reflected in last year's Chicago Teachers Union strike, and I think Professor Warren's talk here today is both a tribute to the Roosevelt legacy and a timely interrogation of a topic critical to the daily lives and livelihoods of all those who live and toil in America. Um, I just want to mention too that at the end of the talk there should be some time for questions, um, and I hope that everyone too will join us um, after the talk for a reception on the 8th floor, Auditorium 814. Uh, but without further delay, I'd like to ask my colleague in the history department and the president of Roosevelt University, Charles R. Middleton, um, to the podium to introduce the speaker. Thank you. Uh, 
which it uses to spread information about America and its political system to Francophone, that is, French-speaking nations in Africa. So after his lecture, he will take questions, but would you please give me, join with me in giving him a welcome. <laughs> of 
politically structured labor markets will exist, what kind of political economy will exist, what are their consequences, and who wins and who loses. So I identify three discrete yet overlapping periods characterizing the development of American political economy from the founding to the present. And I would add that I think of it as a very racialized economy. So a lot of my talk will deal with race in addition to questions of labor and workers' rights because I don't think we can separate our history of racial subjugation from the subjugation of workers in America. So what's key about each of these three regimes, feudal or pre-industrial regime, an industrial regime, and then our current post-industrial They overlap with each other in many ways, and they are contested. Workers fight for more rights in each of these regimes. But the point is that they're politically defined and they're politically constructed. Citizenship laws have defined racialized groups on the one hand as either eligible or not eligible to make claims for justice on political and market institutions, while state regulations governing employment relations have served the equivalent function in prescribing the rights and freedoms of workers across race. The cumulative results of politically contested settlements over the rules of the game, over laws, over regulations that define political membership on the one hand, as well as the rules of the game that define the rights that workers have in the labor market. All of these contestations over the rules of the game shape broad patterns of inequality that we've seen over time. They shape unequal employment access for certain groups of workers, they shape job quality, and they shape overall outcomes for American people and workers and society and the economy. So let me start with this first regime, what I call the feudal or pre-industrial regime, defined largely by a southern agricultural plantation system based on the racially explicit exploitation of African slave labor. It was followed in the post-emancipation period by the exploitation of Jim Crow share, share proper labor. This first feudal regime is the clearest example of the role of politics in constructing a racialized labor market. This order, this regime, in which both race and labor were mutually dependent, on the one hand tied together notions of race with civic status so that African Americans were explicitly excluded from membership in the polity, excluded from being citizens, in addition to a feudal set of labor relations which defined workers at the workplace under what we call master-servant law drawn from 13th century Britain. So we had a descriptive categorization based on race combined with exploitation of racialized slave to labor, exclusion of blacks from all political and social institutions, for some free whites who were defined in relation to slaves, they were still inhabiting a universe of feudal labor relations at the workplace, even if they had certain freedoms due to citizenship in society. Now one key aspect of this feudal or pre-industrial economic regime that I want to emphasize is the place of African American workers. While excluded from political membership pre-emancipation, all black workers were included in this economic regime, as you might think of racial slavery as a full employment program. That was a joke. <laughs> Post-emancipation, the vast majority of the free black population was still employed, albeit in conditions very similar to slavery under a debt even system, where black workers essentially never got out of debt in the South. Now, this harsh and feudal system of the exploitation of African American workers was the core of American political economy for over a century. And it would take structural, demographic, and political transformations beginning in the late 19th and early 20th century to begin the shift from this feudal or pre industrial regime to the second regime I have listed there, the industrial regime. Let me summarize this first regime by saying under a feudal or pre industrial pre-industrial political economy. We did have craft workers, where workers were free. There were craft workers who possessed, as a group, complete knowledge about the production process in their particular trade. 
who often use their own tools and materials to produce shoes or barrels or steel. They have a monopoly of knowledge of the production process. Products are produced in local and regional labor markets. And the model of unionism that emerged in this regime was the model of craft unions. Craft unions were producers' associations with yields, and in this, and craft unions workers actually had economic power vis a vis employers. They were actually able to raise standards under some conditions, despite operating within a feudal legal structure. To sum up the role of law in this system, we had citizenship laws, which excluded blacks and others from basic membership in the polity, so they were able to make claims on the state. But in terms of labor laws in this regime, collective action was regulated by the common law doctrine of criminal conspiracy. Unions themselves were considered criminal conspiracies. Associations were illegal in the beginning, as well as their actions. This eventually shifted to the courts making unions technically legal, but saying all their activities were illegal, striking and picketing. So for this entire first regime of the country's founding, Collective action, worker organizing, was explicitly illegal. It's not allowed under the law. It doesn't mean it didn't happen, but it was not a freedom afforded to workers in this country. So next we have the industrial political economic regime. And industrialization in America, like in other parts of the world, radically reorganized the process and production of work. It changed the meaning of race in this country and it shaped the possibilities for political action and mobilization. Now, often re referred to as Fordism, named for the production process made famous by Henry Ford's automobile factories in Detroit. This mass production and mass consumption-based economy was strongly shaped by state policy at the same time that the social dislocations of industrial workers produced a counter-movement for new social protections. The state was involved in shaping this economy from infrastructure investments in canals and railroads to the disciplining, and the important point, the disciplining of unruly workers. The national state was deeply intertwined with the rapid and vast industrialization of the American economy. And this industrialization period during the late 19th century saw the emancipation of former black slaves, a short period of freedom and a move towards racial equality during Reconstruction, followed by racial retrenchment by the turn of the century, by the turn of the 20th century, whether through state-imposed black codes or the Supreme Court's 1896 Platinum <coughs> decision, re-establishing legal racial exclusion and segregation. At the same time, the capaciousness of industrialization provoked the most bitter and bloody labor conflicts among white workers in the developed world. We have the bloodiest labor history among all rich democracies in the world. Former slaves to Chinese immigrants to white workers, all groups of workers, for all groups of workers, political institutions set the rules of the game governing the economy and determine the opportunities for all workers to organize and to mobilize. The federal as well as state governments denied workers any legal rights to organize and strike for the most part, while workers of color were still excluded from political institutions and full citizenship. And here I want to emphasize that political institutions matter greatly when we think about the history of the labor movement and of all movements for social justice in this country. We had a long period of judicial repression of collective action and worker protection. This occurred in three ways. I've already mentioned one, and that was considering labor and worker collective action as criminal conspiracies, so illegal to come together, join together. Then we had a period, starting around the 1880s, moving through the 1920s, of the labor injunction. Courts use of the labor injunction to stop any kind of collective action was often backed up by the full force of the state, whether the military, the police, or the National Guard. And the third way in which the courts invalidated any kind of movement towards workers' rights was through invalidation of social protections or the judicial nullification of wage, hour, and child labor laws. The court struck down almost every attempt to regulate child labor, wages and conditions, working conditions, number of hours worked for decades in the, at the turn of the century. 
This repression, essentially, by the courts of workers' rights shaped the labor movement's strategy in which it at first retreated from politics just as a strategic move, a strategic pullback. And this is what we call volunteerism in the scholarship of unions focusing on economic power and not political power became ultimately a principle. It started as a strategy of retreat and became a principle that the labor movement embraced until that they broke with that in the 1930s and the New Deal was, was primarily the reason for that. So to sum up this point though about courts and political institutions, as political scientist Karen Warren says, American labor relations in the 19th and early 20th century were, in their essential character, feudal. There is continuity in labor regulation from Tudor England through the Gilded Age, the law, as I mentioned, of master and servant, and this feudal set of labor relations was not defeated until not only was the right to signed in 1935, but it really shifted our entire corpus of labor law when the Supreme Court said the Wagner was constitutional two years later in 1937. Now, coincidentally, the first gilded age of extreme inequality in the concentration of wealth emerged at a moment after racial advancement and retrenchment. You see a similar pattern in the 20th century of civil rights victories in the 60s, some racial advancement, but then followed closely by the rise of the second gilded age of extreme economic inequality. Back to the first Gilded Age, and here I'm still in the industrial era. This growing inequality of the Gilded Age would lead to the external shock of the Great Depression, which combined with the social and economic effects of World War II, provided a political opportunity for the labor movement to achieve New Deal social reforms that gave birth to the uniquely exceptional American welfare state. In addition, the post-war labor court created what scholars call a private welfare state for advantaged labor insiders, along with labor stability, rising productivity, declining inequality, and increased social and economic mobility for poor and working class Americans. The New Deal social programs were a huge step forward for workers in this country, but I need to point out that we know that with the greatness of the New Deal, and New Deal policies, they were still racially exclusive and racially discriminatory. And that was a legacy of the path-dependent effect or the causal effect of the previous regime. The racial structures in place from the feudal era carried over into this industrial regime, not only shaping the economy, but shaping our social legislation. Two examples of this, and they still exist to this day, the National Labor Relations Act of 1935 still include occupational exclusions for domestic and agricultural workers, as does the Social Security Act, although that was amended later, but the Fair Labor Standards Act, the minimum wage, both the minimum wage and the Wagner Act, still to this day include those occupational exclusions, which came about as a compromise with Southern Democrats to exclude those two occupations which are racially neutral have got great racial locations, insofar as most black workers in the 1930s were southern-based in, in agricultural and domestic work. So those racial legacies in New Deal social policy still exist, still exist to this day and have shaped the ability of those workers in particular to organize for better working conditions. Those racialized labor policies would ultimately have long-term consequences for the development of both the labor and the black freedom movements. The 1947 Taft-Hartley Taft -Hartley labor law reform left in place those racialized occupational exclusions while severely limiting the power and growth of organized labor across the South, just at the moment that the labor movement began seriously threatening the feudal and industrial racial and economic Jim Crow orders. So we have a curtailment of labor power by Taft Hartley. We still have racial exclusions. These would prove consequential for the claims and strategies advanced <coughs> by our two main movements I'm focused on here, the labor and the black freedom movements, as they made claims, especially in the case of the civil rights movement in the 1960s and the labor movement over the course of that time. And here's 
one example of why this is important. So we just celebrated this year the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Next year, we'll celebrate the 50th anniversary of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The two key victories, along with the 65 Voting Rights Act, two of the, two of the key victories of this, or moments of the Civil Rights Movement. If you look at the claims or the demands made from the March on Washington in 1963, we have still yet to come close to accomplishing them. A living wage for all Americans. In fact, the, living, the minimum wage increase was the demand was two dollars an hour for minimum wage in 1963, which is somewhere around fourteen dollars a day an hour, which is supposed to demand for fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage we get now. Not even close to achieving that goal, even though it was a principal demand of the March on Washington, this economic crisis. Demand. So let me try to sum up, and I need to move faster because I told you I had pretty pictures, and I get to show you something. So. The industrial era moved into our current post-industrial era or economic regime. By the way, as I mentioned, craft unions emerged under the feudal period, industrial unions emerged under the industrial economic order to deal with national employers and national labor markets. We had moved from a local regional set of labor markets to a national labor market. That was the breakthrough, was the creation of industrial unions. And we might ask later on, what will be the breakthrough labor strategies for our current post-industrial or digital era? So let me turn to this period now. So this third post-industrial economic regime we've transitioned to, and it involved two fundamental changes, one structural, one political. The structural shift was from an industrial General Motors economy to a post-industrial Walmart economy characterized by mass deindustrialization, job growth at both the high and low ends of the labor market, not so much in the middle, high levels of job insecurity, mass consumption driven by consumer debt as a result of stagnant wages, increasing income inequality, the top 1% of Americans gaining a larger share of national income. The second political change was one of democratic inclusion. So the mid 20th century civil rights movement brought about the triumphant end to formal de jure racial exclusion and secure political rights associated with citizenship in the American context for the first time. Now this relationship between structural and political changes is not straightforward, and as I mentioned before, when we saw democratic inclusion at the end of the Civil War, it was followed quickly by the rise of the Gilded Age and increasing economic inequality, and indeed that is what we've seen today racial advancement, a second great reconstruction when it came to civil rights and racial justice, followed by the rise of a second Gilded Age in which we now live. So seen in long historical time, from this country's founding to the present, we have always treated work and the workplace as not subject to democratic principles, no matter the economic regime under which we've been living, but for a moment of time, 1930s, a really a, a short lived and long historical perspective. Most often we have separated political democracy from workplace democracy. And of course, when we consider the long journey of African Americans in America from slavery to freedom, principles of democracy and justice applied neither at the workplace or in the broader society. They weren't separate but deeply intertwined. The institution of slavery, slavery as a feudal institution as in its own right, was deeply intertwined with non-citizenship. And African Americans are not the only marginalized group to have experienced deep injustice, from women to immigrants past and present, or LGBT people who don't have workplace protections. This is a common theme of how we have treated the workplace in American political history. And every era we have had a major turning point for labor, where labor has had to innovate and create a breakthrough strategy, the labor movement, for trying to advance economic and racial and social justice. So, let me turn now to, have I depressed you yet? <laughs> let me now turn to some slides on contemporary inequality and the challenge that labor faces today. So I'm going to run through these very, very quickly so we can get to the future of the labor movement. 
So as you know, 2007, 2008, right before the economic crash, we recorded the highest level of income inequality since we had right before the Great Depression, with the top 1% roughly taking home a quarter of, of the nation's income. The United States, in comparative perspective, leads the rest of the developed world in the level of inequality. We are that red line leading the pack and in income inequality on the right-hand side of this chart. To give you a sense over time, you see that wages have essentially been stagnant both before taxes and after taxes, with the exception of the top 1%, who, as you can see, has done very well since the late 1970s, while the rest of us have stayed stagnant when it comes to wages and income. We are now at record levels of the number of people in poverty in America. The poverty rate overall is at 15%, but with conservative estimates, 46 million Americans are in poverty, but we also know that about 100 million Americans, or one out of every three Americans, lives in poverty or very close to the poverty line. So one out of three Americans is essentially struggling to survive in contemporary America. When we look at poverty data by gender, by race, we know it's much higher for blacks and Hispanics. Roughly one out of four whites and Hispanics live in poverty. We lead all rich democracies with the number of children that live in poverty. One out of four American children live below the poverty line. And these are very conservative estimates, I should add. When you look at this by race in terms of children, this is the percent of poor children living in concentrated poverty. So one out of three Latino children, 45% of black children, almost half of black kids live in concentrated poverty. Four out of 10 American Indian kids live in concentrated poverty. Concentrated poverty is neighborhoods of 30% poverty levels or higher. Median household income has stayed flat for the last 30 years. So if you look at 2011 versus 1989, almost every racial group is about the same. Although, as you see, there are racial differences between the median income of households. I, I tell you, I'm going to make these very fast. We can make these available by the way. And a lot of inequality, in my view, inequality and poverty in America is driven by the nature of our economy. And it's driven by the transition to a low-wage economy from an economy of the mid-20th century that had economic mobility and middle-class jobs, career ladders to make it into the middle class. Yet again, the U.S. is the leader when it comes to the share of our workforce that had low-wage jobs. If you look at this chart, the left-hand side is, are the jobs lost in the current recession, the Great Recession by high, mid, or low-wage occupations. So you see we've lost an incredible amount of middle-class jobs. But when you look at the right-hand side, most of the jobs, or 60% of the jobs we've created since the recession have been low-wage jobs. So we're really creating a low-wage economy, replacing an economy with a strong middle. This is the share of workers earning poverty-level wages over the last 40 years. And as you see here, that there are racial differences, but overall the pattern hasn't changed much. So 40% in 2011 of Hispanics work in poverty level jobs, 36% of, black, of blacks, and one out of four whites in America work at poverty level jobs. When we look more closely at African American workers, this is from an older data set from the 2000 census, but nationally, more than half of black workers are in low-wage jobs. And in Chicago, it's a little better. 44% still unacceptably high levels of low-wage work, where people can find work. Some pundits and commentators often say, well, that's fine, Dorian. We understand that there are low-wage jobs, that we have high levels of inequality, but essentially the solution is to 
educate people, to equip people with the skills for the new knowledge economy. And yes, absolutely, we're all here in the university setting because we believe in education, we believe in higher education, and getting the most amount of skills we have, we can get to be competitive. But there is something different happening in the economy that does not quite match up with that traditional solution. And so this is a, a table of the 20, the 20 occupations with the largest growth, uh, let me say that again, occupations, largest growth, fastest growing occupations, the top 20. So this is what our economy is going to look like in 2020. These are the jobs that we are creating right now. 16 of these 20 fastest growing occupations require nothing more than a high school diploma. Let me say that again. 16 of the 20 fastest growing occupations in America require nothing more than a high school diploma. The implication is, and this is the same data but in graphic form, if we think we're going to educate ourselves out of an inequality problem, we are fooling ourselves. There are not enough high wage jobs being created for the amount of people we're educating. So essentially, we're creating an over-educated workforce for the supply of jobs that we are creating in our economy. And that leads to then a second strategy we have to consider. As my friend Virginia Parks always says to me, you can upgrade the worker or you can upgrade the job. And we have to be thinking about strategies that upgrade the job, that change the quality of jobs that we're creating from low-wage jobs to middle-class jobs, which is what the labor movement did in the 20th century. In addition to the growth of low-wage jobs, we also have a new problem of the rise of involuntary part-time work of people who go to work every day and want to work full-time, but employers maybe only give them 20 hours a week or 25 hours a week or 30 if you're lucky. So this is a growing problem, and the irony of this problem is that the labor movement fought for centuries for the 40-hour work week, but to get a 100-hour work week or an 80-hour work week or a 60-hour work week down to 40 hours. And now we're in a position where we have to fight for the 40-hour work week from the other direction, from the notion of getting people full-time work if they want it. In terms of quality of jobs, not only do we create low-wage jobs, we create jobs that <coughs> don't require any benefits unlike the rest of the developed world. So we don't mandate any paid holidays or paid vacation days for any of our employers, unlike the rest of the world. And if you look at um, France, for instance, France is my favorite, so all the way up over on the left. Yes, the French government mandates one paid holiday, but boy, 30 paid vacation days, mandatory in France. They see the whole country of France going on vacation in August. There's just nobody around. They're all off somewhere. We, you see us, we're, we're at zero. We grew leaders on that. So, in addition to the creation of low-wage jobs, the lack of quality jobs in terms of benefits, we also have a growing epidemic of what we call wage theft. This is where workers work a certain amount of hours and employers refuse to pay them for the hours they worked. Whether it's overtime, whether it's just simply they worked six hours today, they might only get paid four hours. If they're tipped employees, they often don't get tip share. This is a growing epidemic of employers essentially engaging in criminal activity and stealing the wages that people have earned. So a recent study uh, showed that the Department of Labor collected about $185 million in stolen wages for workers in 2008. That is simply the tip of the iceberg of this problem. If the Department of Labor could collect $185 million in one year in, back in stolen wages, imagine what the magnitude is. It's in the billions a year that workers are being cheated out of their wages. In addition to low-wage work, still high levels of unemployment, by the way, I haven't mentioned, no paid vacation, poor, no paid sick days, wage theft, I mentioned earlier we're about to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act, the primary purpose of which was to eliminate discrimination at the workplace, and especially to eliminate occupational segregation by race and by sex. 
And we have not done very well in the last 50 years on this measure either. So this is a hypothetical trajectory of how our, our economy could have evolved in response to the 64 Civil Rights Act. So the top line you see there is no change. And just look at the bottom line that's, that's serving as, a, as a, an angle for the triangle there. That's continuous desegregation. So if the workplace had desegregated over the last 40, 50 years, we'd see a downward trend. That's what we would expect to see. So let me show you what we've actually seen. The American workplace is still highly segregated by race, by sex, by immigration status. We made some progress until about 1980, and then patterns of occupational segregation level up. Why this matters is because we know that women get paid less for the same work that men do. We know that African Americans, Latinos get paid less for the same jobs and work that white workers do. And occupational segregation is a huge driver of this. And we have failed to get our heads around appropriate policy challenges and other, other kinds of challenges to this huge problem of occupational segregation. I'm presenting this to you to suggest that this is an issue that the labor movement of today and tomorrow needs to take on much more squarely. OK. And if I have a question about those employment statistics, let me tell you to lock up more people in the world. Than anybody else, we lock up more people in the top 35 European countries combined. Even though we've seen a decline in violent crime rates, the incarceration rate is still way too high. And of course, this affects the employment prospects of those returning citizens once they have finished their sentences. So, yet another problem that we have to, another challenge to our current economy. And then finally, I'm getting to labor and the labor movement directly. We know that the labor movement has been in decline for a long time, from the post-war high in the 1950s of one out of three workers being a member of a private sector union. Now we are at some of the lowest rates of union membership in, I think it's 97 years in the private sector. Of course, there are two different stories here. The public sector still has a significantly higher rate of unionization, one out of three, more than one out of three workers in the public sector are union members. Although, as you know very well here in Chicago, public employees have been under attack for a long time. Half of all union members are only in seven states. So labor is very geographically constrained. And this has implications for politics, which I'll turn to in a few slides. But Illinois is the third largest number of unionized workers in the country. We've seen a decline as a result of declining unionization, increasing employer hostility to workers trying to organize. We've seen a decline in the number of National Labor, Board, National Labor Relations Board elections of workers and unions declining to use this process as a route to unionization, and instead going around the National Labor Relations Board using other strategies. Neutrality and car check is one that I want to mention because I want to come back to that since the Supreme Court heard a very important case yesterday about this very issue. To give you a sense of the, the declining significance of the National Labor Relations Board, in 1970, there were over seven, almost 8,000 workplace elections for unionization. Almost 300,000 workers were organized into the labor movement using that process. By the mid-'80s, we've been down to, we've got down to 3,000 elections, only about 80 workers. 80,000 workers organized through this process and in 2008. From 8,000 elections a year, by the way, to only about 1,500 elections in 2008, only 70,000 as opposed to 270,000 workers unionized through that process. But I want to point out that there were 400,000 workers organized in 2008. Only 70,000 used the National Labor Relations Board process this key emblem of the Roosevelt legacy, not the New Deal legacy, workers are going around this process and using some other key avenues to win better working conditions. This is just a geographic showing of the data I presented you a minute ago of where there is strong labor union membership. You see it's on the coast. The darker areas are areas with high union membership. In the Midwest and on the East Coast, and this map will probably look very familiar to you. It's not a coincidence that 
the parts that are shaded in map almost very nicely and perfectly with our electoral map. This gives you just a sense of the geographic decline of unions. If there's one thing that's true in American political and economic history, the South has always dominated not only our politics, but the economic models that dominated in any given era. And it's the right to work South that has led to the revolution in low wage, the rise of low wage work. So it's not an accident that Walmart comes from that middle of Arkansas. So to continue, declining unionization, although as you see, there's a difference between the public sector and the private sector here. The public sector is still somewhat strong, although clearly under attack these days. Skip over that. We also have a decline in the use of strikes and the ability of workers to fill in power to strike. In the 70s and 80s, even we still had hundreds of strikes involving workers at workplaces of a thousand or more. This is a, a picture of large strikes and, and all strikes over the course of the last 30 years or so. This is significant. I want you to remember this slide to understand how innovative and risky it is for fast food or retail workers to do one day strikes today. And this is one of the reasons why I'm actually very optimistic about the future of the way we move. But we, we have, workers have no strike button any longer but it's being Okay, so what are the consequences of declining union density? This is a chart showing you the decline of union membership on the bottom, with the share of income going to the top 10%. So as unions got stronger in the 30s and 40s, our income was shared more broadly as a nation among all workers. But as the movement has declined, and this is a better picture of this, this is the rate of union membership and the middle class share of aggregate income. As you can see, these are highly correlated and downward slope. So as union membership has gone down, so has middle class share of income. The minimum wage is also part of this problem, which is not kept up with inflation. The minimum wage in 1968, if we were counting in, in $2012, would be $19,000 for a full-time worker. It's only $15,000 today. We failed to update our policies to keep up with our changing economy. And I want to suggest all of what I've said up to this point. So the rise of low-wage work, growing inequality, the decline of the labor movement. This is all important for one really, really crucial issue. And this is at the heart of the narrative we tell ourselves about the American dream. We tell ourselves that in this country, unlike any other before in human history, that if you're born poor, you can make it to the working class or the middle class or even become rich. That has been the promise of America since its founding from sun. And it was true for a small moment in our history. In the middle part of the 20th century, we created the conditions, and the labor movement created the conditions for upward mobility so that people did actually have a chance to make it to the middle class if you were born poor. So what I want to say to you today is that is no longer the case. We are no longer a society of upward economic or social mobility. We are back essentially to being almost a caste system in some ways. So this data I'm going to show you, and I'll interpret it for you. This is what economists and sociologists use to measure mobility. And what they do is they take surveys of families and they measure what's the, the father, usually it's the father in a, in a family, what's the father's income and status. And then they look over time, over decades, to see do the sons and daughters say, stay in the same income category or do they rise out of the poor? Uh, do, they, do they go from being poor to working class and middle class? Or if you're rich, do you stay rich or do you fall? The notion of upward mobility or social mobility is not only that everyone's climbing up, but something about the fall too in a truly mobile system. So this shows you the way we measure this is from zero to one. So the lower the number, the more mobile we are as a society. If that chart gets to one, that means everybody who's born poor stays poor. Everybody who's born rich stays rich. So as you see here, 
in the 1950s and the 60s, 70s, and even by 1980, we were becoming a much more socially mobile society. Your social class had determined, your parents' social class had determined where you ended up. And then starting in 1990 and in 2000, that began to change. And your parents' status in life more and more determines where you end up in life. This is another way to present this data. This is income inequality on the one hand with social mobility, looking at mobility on the other. The United States and the United Kingdom are the most unequal and the least socially mobile societies right now on the planet. This also has a geographical dimension. If you look at the darker areas, and there's, a, there's some darkness there for Chicago, by the way, but you see the Deep South, and this chart is showing you, and you can read on the left-hand side, the chance a child raised in the bottom fifth rows to the top fifth of the income distribution. So basically, the chance that a poor kid made it to a higher social class. And the darker areas, the reddish areas, are the places where it's least likely. So only roughly 4%. Or to say it differently, again, same chart. I know I'm a guardian, you know, I'm going to wrap up soon. This is the probability that a child born in the bottom income quintile ends up staying in that social category or social class position or moves up to the highest income quartile. And I just want to show you the racial differences. So one out of three white kids in America who are born poor and poor stay poor. Two out of three white kids born poor stay poor. No social mobility whatsoever. So, depressed yet? Yes. yes, okay. This is also in the midst of record profits, like the low wages. Okay, so now I'm finally getting to the optimistic part, I promise. And let me start this last two minutes by saying that the vision of the future of the labor movement that at least I have and many others have is grounded in the legacy of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. And in particular, I want to I'm skipping a lot here. I want to come to Roosevelt's famous four freedoms. I'm affiliated with the Roosevelt Institute in New York and in Hyde Park, and I'm part of something called the Four Freedoms Center, which is a think tank that was founded in 2009 to think about our future economy and our future progress in America, or potential progress. So I want to start with President Roosevelt's address in 1941, the State of the Union address, where he first outlined what he thought were the four essential freedoms that all people should possess in the world. These four freedoms end up becoming encoded in the United Nations later on in the 1940s. So Roosevelt says, in future days, we, which we seek to make secure, we look forward to a world founded upon four essential human freedoms. The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third, and here is for me the most important freedom for the labor movement. The third is freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understandings which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. And the fourth, he says, is the freedom from fear, which translated into world terms means a worldwide reduction of ar armaments to such a point and in such a thorough fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor. He ends by saying, that is no vision of a distant millennium. It is a definite basis for a kind of world attainable in our own time and generation. And I think that third freedom, freedom from want, is indeed the challenge for today's labor movement and for the future of the labor movement. To once and first for all secure that third freedom in America in a way that has never been really secured before, freedom from want. So how to do this? And I'm optimistic because I think we are seeing this now. 
There's something called Occupy Wall Street a couple of years ago that captured our imagination. And this is my favorite cover of the 1%. With signs protesting cheap things as they are, and the wealth left alone, et cetera. So there is a fight on our hands, but I'm confident that the future of the labor movement is in good hands, and here's why. And this is a promise I made. So I, as I mentioned earlier, I think there have always been two sources of worker power, economic power and political power. And economic power has been mostly through disruptive tactics to leverage bargaining power directly with employers. This was what AFL craft unions were able to do most effectively. They had skills, they had bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis employers. They didn't need political power to win breakthroughs and gains for workers at the workplace. Skilled workers could control the labor supply and shut down production. They could engage in strikes. And today I think we see this kind of economic power from what are called comprehensive campaigns, strategic corporate campaigns, the one-day strikes of fast food workers, of Walmart workers, of other workers. That's disruptive economic power is key, and labor is relearning really how to use that disruptive economic power. The second kind of power is political power, and it's both conventional and disruptive, whether it's elections or lobbying or campaign contributions, or other kinds, again, of disruptive political tactics to put pressure on legislators to have labor's back and to be more labor friendly. Now, of course, both of these strategies are currently being threatened, but that's nothing new when you think about labor law and the rights of workers in long historical perspective. So I mentioned briefly that there is a court case, the Supreme Court yesterday, in fact, heard a case fundamentally getting at the role of labor's economic power through these corporate or comprehensive campaigns. And we can talk about the Q&A details, but I'm actually optimistic based on reading the transcripts that the courts for once will uphold labor's right to engage in these kind of campaigns. I'm actually very optimistic about that. And that will be one of the key routes to putting pressure on employers much as President Middleton discussed in introducing me, that's what the Coalition of Motley Workers has been able to do very well through economic pressure, through economic power, with lots of allies, putting pressure on employers to increase standards in the industry. Secondly, there's the other route to power, and that's political power. And I think the last 20 years shows, without any doubt, the democratic experimentalism or we might call progressive federalism that has been used by the progressive and labor to increase standards at the local and state level. The first, minimum, the first living wage ordinance was passed almost 20 years ago now. Now we have over 150 municipalities across the country. We have statewide minimum wage increases. These are political campaigns that the labor movement and its allies engages in to increase wages through politics. And we just saw this in New Jersey last week. We saw it at a little town near Seattle as well. Last week, $15 an hour at SeaTac. That won. Again, these are political experiments. And this has been where labor has been most successful in the last 20 years, using political power via local and state regulations to raise wages and standards for all. And we've seen this before in our history with child labor, with uh, limiting working hours that were eventually scaled up to the national level. So we have a, a great corpus of legislative and political victories of the last 20 years that I think have set the stage for an incredible breakthrough by the end of this decade for the labor movement at the national level that makes me very, very optimistic. So I'm convinced that we are seeing a turning point on both of these dimensions, the use of economic power and political power by the workers in the labor movement, that will propel us indeed towards a country and a world that will truly and for once bring about that third famous freedom, freedom from want, and towards a more truly democratic and just world for all. Thanks very much. And
Thank you. 